I am Steve Sand. I am the director of the SOAS China Institute. The first speaker of this series of lecture was Sir John Key, the former Prime Minister of New Zealand who came here in September last year. This is a series of lecture by distinguished scholars and practitioners whose scholarship or insights based on policymaking and international engagement with some of the most important issues in the world is being established at SOAS for the simple reasons that SOAS is at the cutting edge in the study and promotion of the understanding of some of the most important and pressing issues that we have to confront in the world today. This series of lecture is named after WSD and Dr. Handa. For those of you who do not know, um, WSD stands for the Worldwide Support for Development, which is a Japan-based non-profit organization. Dr. Haruhisha Handa is a great philanthropist who is committed to support the disadvantaged people and communities all over the world. Being the, a leading university and the most progressive one at that in England, SOAS obviously stands in the forefront in the promotion of the understanding of the subjects close to the heart of Dr. Handa and the remit of WSD. And for today's distinguished lecture, I'm delighted to present to you Professor Thomas Christensen. Now, Tom is the Professor of Public and International Affairs and the Director of the China and the World Program at Columbia University. Before joining Columbia, he held the William P. Boswell Chair at Princeton University, where he spent most of his illustrious academic career. He had also previously taught at Cornell and, and, and at MIT. From 2006 to 2008, he took a leave of absence from Princeton to serve as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State in the George W. Bush administration. Though I should hasten to add that Tom is a non-partisan scholar diplomat. And after the Bush administration, he continued to serve as a senior advisor to the State Department under the Obama administration, and indeed he only stood down from that road earlier this year. His most, uh, Tom has published very, very extensively and some absolute classics, but his most uh, recent book is The China Challenge, Shaping the Choices of a Rising Power, which became the editor's choice in the New York book review, and the book, I think, is also the recipient of the Arthur Ross Book Award Silver Medal in 2016. Yeah. And the subject that he is going to take on this afternoon is China's rise and the security of East Asia. Over to you, Professor Christian. Hey, I'll go up there. Eh? Please do. Thanks very much. Can people hear me? That's good. That's good. OK, thank you very much for being here. I'm really honored by your presence, especially on a Friday evening. Uh, it's quite a turnout. <laughs> I'm really flattered. Um, I wanted to thank uh, Steve Tang, who uh, is an old friend, and I've known him uh, in multiple institutions. And I just wanted to say that it's uh, very good of SOAS for the institution to have drawn him here. Uh, he's really a great asset for you to have here, and it's a great program that he runs. I also wanted to thank the Honda Foundation for their the Honda Foundation for uh, their generosity and for this program. And I'm really honored to be asked to be the second speaker in this series. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is the rise of China and the security challenges for my country, the United States, and its friends and allies and partners in East Asia. Um, and I thought I would open up with a talk of about maybe 35, 40 minutes, uh, and then take your questions and comments. And I see two major challenges uh, posed by the rise of China. 
Um, one is uh, how to dissuade China from settling its many disputes with its neighbors, its so sovereignty disputes with its neighbors. Um, the PRC and its many neighbors have sovereignty disputes, especially at sea. And how to dissuade China from settling those disputes either through the use of force or the use of coercion. Uh, if China were to try to settle all those disputes through force and coercion, it would destabilize a region that's very important to the United States, obviously very important to U.S. friends, allies, and partners, and neighbors of China in East Asia, and actually important to the entire world, including Europe, because of the importance of East Asia uh, to the globalized economy uh, in the entire world. This challenge, I think, is often missed by many of my compatriots, commentaries, pundits, who believe that the real challenge is one of the two of these following options. One is that China is trying to drive the United States ent entirely out of East Asia uh, so as to dominate the region at America's expense. The second is that China will soon become a global rival of the United States and its allies, uh, projecting power around the world and becoming a peer competitor rival of the United States. I don't think either of these things are the real challenge. I'll focus on those sovereignty disputes in East Asia for a reason. I think that there is a lack of persistent evidence that China is trying to drive the United States out of East Asia entirely. If it were trying to do so, it would be extremely destabilizing and dangerous, but I don't see persistent evidence that that is the case. And I don't think China will have the capacity for decades to come to be a global rival, a peer competitor of the United States around the world. And we can talk about that in the question and answer period. But I don't think China has the economic, military, and particularly diplomatic wherewithal to pose such a challenge. So I think a lot of Americans exaggerate uh, China's capacities when they make that, 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 they raise those concerns as the primary one. But that's where the good news ends from an American perspective. China doesn't need to be a global peer competitor of the United States to pose real challenges to American national security interests in East Asia and obviously to the national security interests of China's uh, United States friends and partners in East Asia. Um, not everything has to be symmetrical to be challenging, and China is posing a very uh, strong and increasingly powerful asymmetrical challenge to American forward presence in East Asia, which I believe, and many American security analysts believe, have been a major source of peace and stability in East Asia since the end of World War II. So that's challenge one. The second challenge is of a different nature, and that is how to convince China to actively contribute to global security goals of most of the international community in the form of dissuading certain actors from developing uh, weapons of mass destruction, in particular nuclear weapons. And here I have in mind North Korea and Iran. And the reality here is that China's economic footprint in areas like North Korea and Iran are so great that the rest of the world has real difficulty pressuring those regimes into certain types of behavior and avoiding certain types of behavior without China's active cooperation. And if China obstructs the international efforts, they're extremely difficult to, uh, to, to, it's very difficult to make them succeed, those international efforts, if China actively obstructs. But even if China doesn't contribute, it's a big problem because uh, China is not only institutionally powerful because of its place in the UN, but it's economically powerful. And I'll describe this in, uh, toward the end of the talk, that China is by far the biggest economic partner, not just of North Korea, but also of Iran. Um, so without China's cooperation, very difficult to pressure uh, those countries. Okay, so let's talk about the security in the region first. And I have the map up here, and I think I can, does this show on the screen? Okay, good. Uh, that shows on the screen, so I can use that as a pointer. Uh, China has many points of friction with its neighbors, um, and those points of friction are growing as China's power grows. This is a natural function of rising power that countries rub up against their neighbors more often and more frequently, and sometimes in, uh, in uh, ways that cause friction and annoyance uh, in other countries. Uh, this is not a particular China problem, and I'm not making in my talk any kind of cultural generalities about China as a rising power as opposed to any other rising power. And I wrote an article in 2000 with my colleague Dick Betts at Columbia University, 
And in it, we said, if a rising, a rising China handles its rise in its own region as badly as the United States handled its rise in its region in the late 19th century, we're all in big trouble. And you probably know the history. The United States, a rising United States, had jingoistic domestic politics and uh, got into a totally unnecessary war with Spain over Cuba and ended up fighting a large counterinsurgency war in the Philippines. Um, so I, I'm not picking on China when I say China's rise is a challenge to the neighborhood. It's going to cause frictions. And those frictions are going to have to be handled well by the United States and other actors. Um, the reason is that. China's traditional military was a military that had two goals. And um, those goals were basically to deter or defend the Chinese Communist Party against domestic and international foes. So keep that in mind. That was the goal of the, the People's Liberation Army. To a large degree, it's still the stated goal of the People's Liberation Army. It's a party army, not a national army. And its goal is to protect the Chinese Communist Party against foreign and domestic foes. And it did that for decades uh, in, the, in the PRC period through two methods. One was to have a very large land army at home. It wasn't very mobile. It didn't project power abroad. And the other was to have a rudimentary nuclear force. According to public reports, the, the traditional Chinese nuclear force was some two dozen long-range missiles with nuclear uh, capability that could carry nuclear weapons. And according to public reports, those nuclear weapons weren't even attached to the missiles in real time. They had to be attached. The missiles had to be fueled up. They were liquid fuel missiles. And this was a basic minimum deterrent against first the United States in the first half of the Cold War, and then against the Soviet Union in the second half of the Cold War, when China basically switches sides in the Cold War uh, after the Nixon trip to China. This has all changed. And that's really what causes a lot of the military and security frictions. China now has significant power projection capability off of its shore for the first time. And this process really started in the reform era, but it particularly took off in the period after 1999, during Jiang Zemin's presidency in China, where China developed Navy capabilities, Air Force capabilities, and rocket force capabilities that allowed China for the first time to project conventional power far off China's shores into these regions here. And that's where the sovereignty disputes are. So I'll talk about the sovereignty disputes now before I talk about the military equipment that was developed. And the first important sovereignty dispute from a US perspective is here above Taiwan in the area that the Japanese call the Senkaku Islands and the Chinese call the Diaoyu Islands. Japan is arguably the most important ally of the United States in East Asia. And uh, Japan claims those islands, and so does China. Um, a second sovereignty dispute is a sovereignty dispute over Taiwan. It's a different type of sovereignty dispute than the other ones I will describe. And it really has to do with what the meaning of Taiwan's sovereign identity is in relation to mainland China. And there's a dispute across the Taiwan Strait on that score. And there are debates within Taiwan itself on that score. But that's basically the nature of the dispute. And Taiwan, until 1979, 1980 period, during uh, normalization of US-China relations, was a US ally. And it has been a security partner of the United States since then. And it's an important actor in the region. And if they were fighting across the Taiwan Strait, it would destabilize the entire region. And then there's the South China Sea. And China's claim in the South China Sea is something like this. And I'll show you the map in a moment. Wait, ah, didn't mean to do that. So we'll go do this again. That's the nine dash line. And here is the map with the other disputants. Very complicated. There are six disputants, including the mainland and Taiwan. Taiwan has the same claims as the mainland because it's the traditional Chinese claims in the South China Sea that go back before the founding of the People's Republic of China uh, in the modern period, certainly 1930s. And it was written into the Republic of China uh, 1947 constitution before uh, the CCP successful revolution on the mainland. So this goes way back. So Taiwan's claims and mainland claims are the same. But you can see the other claims. China's claims are very expansive. But some other claims are quite expansive. Vietnam's claims are expansive. This blue line, 
purplish blue line uh, pretty far off Vietnam's coast. And you see Malaysia's claims come up here, overlapping them. The Philippines is kind of a rectangle. It's actually a little bit tighter now than it shows on this map. This map's a little old, but it, it overlaps uh, various claims as well. And then there's Brunei with this tight little rectangle off of Brunei's coast. So you can see these are overlapping claims. So China has developed the capability to project power into these areas and is now rubbing against its neighbors in new ways. And those capabilities are um, asymmetric capabilities from a US perspective. They don't provide China the ability to dominate the United States militarily. So I don't want to give you the impression that I'm saying that China in the near term will be able to dominate the United States militarily. But they pose real challenges for forward deployed US forces. And they pose even bigger challenges for the basing of the United States forces in the region. And they ca cause bigger challenges still for US allies and partners in the region because China is so much bigger than those allies and partners in the region. So it's a real, it's a real challenge, even though I'm not saying China is about to overtake the United States in overall power. So please keep those things separate, okay? And those asymmetric capabilities include accurate, road mobile conventionally tipped ballistic missiles. If public reports are right, and the DOD makes these public reports, so they're pretty authoritative on this, China has developed the capability to strike moving targets at sea, which offsets one of America's great traditional advantages in the Cold War period and the post-Cold War period, which is the ability to send naval aviation fairly safely into various parts of the world to project air power from ships, aircraft carriers. If you can strike a ship that's moving at sea from a land-based, conventionally tipped uh, uh, ballistic missile, this is a real challenge, that advantage for the United States. A second is in the Navy realm, in addition to many new surface ships, there are submarines. Um, lots of new submarines, diesel electric submarines that are relatively quiet and hard to track, and they carry sophisticated weapons. Uh, sea mines, sophisticated torpedoes, and a big challenge for a superior U.S. Navy is sea-launched cruise missiles that can be launched from underneath the surface of the water, which can pose a challenge to a superior Navy when it's forward deployed near China. There are other cruise missiles that can be fired off of surface ships, sometimes small ships, like uh, uh, fast boats, and uh, those pose a challenge as well. There is advanced aircraft, fourth-generation aircraft that China has developed, often by reverse engineering both Russian and American technologies. And there are air defenses, and I think air defenses don't get enough attention because air defenses can cast a uh, an umbrella off the Chinese coast that make it difficult for superior aircraft to fly safely in the area around China. Another asymmetric capability that is quite serious uh, from an American and allied national security perspective. Anti-satellite weapons are also important in China's development because one of the advantages the United States has had in the military sphere is uh, what military experts call C4ISR. I won't unpack that acronym for you. I'll just tell you it is the ability to see and control forces in the battle space in real time. It's a very complicated uh, communications and intelligence uh, capability. And it relies fairly heavily on satellites and the ability to strike satellites from the surface of the Earth, which China demonstrated when I was in the government in January 2007, is considered an asymmetric capability that might be able to offset some of those advantages that the United States has enjoyed. Um, cyber, everybody talks about cyber. I'll just say something about cyber, that the more you know about cyber, the less you talk about it. So uh, I won't go into great detail, but you've read lots and lots of articles about China's growing cyber capability, about Russia's growing cyber capability. You don't see as many articles about American cyber capability. Um, but let's just leave it at that, that cyber is a real potential asymmetric tool for uh, a power that's challenging a stronger power in the United States. Um, finally, this nuclear modernization, and I want you to pay attention to this. I mentioned that rudimentary nuclear deterrent that China has had for decades. Those liquid fuel missiles, probably with the warheads not mated. Well, China has developed solid fuel, fuel road mobile nuclear weapons uh, in order to strengthen its uh, ability to have a retaliatory deterrent against a first strike from, uh, from potential adversaries. Um, this doesn't give China the ability to take out US nuclear weapons, uh, so it's not a first strike capability, but it's a much more sophisticated uh, deterrent, much more sophisticated retaliatory capability. Um, 
and it's uh, mounted on land on road mobile, uh, con uh, road mobile nuclear tipped missiles. A second uh, capability that China's developed is nuclear capable submarines that can launch nuclear tipped missiles from submarines. Uh, and if public reports are right, they've got a couple of these, they've got a couple in development. So it's a rudimentary force, but it's a, it's a naval force with submarines. And I'll tell you why later in the lecture, why that's so important uh, in, my, in my calculation. Um, Okay, so none of these capabilities give China the ability to dominate the United States and its allies uh, in, in the sense of driving the United States out of the region um, or in, in the sense of giving China the ability to become a global peer competitor of the United States. It's not domination, it's a desire to deter, dissuade, delay uh, US intervention on issues that China believes it cares about more than the United States. And if the United States does intervene to uh, delay, dissuade, not delay, but to dissuade uh, local partners from cooperating with the United States and to encourage and convince the United States to leave the dispute and go back home. So that's the real goal, the strategic goal. That's an important enough goal. It's not a new Cold War. I don't believe we're in a new Cold War with China. The Cold War was extremely nasty. Uh, I'm glad it's over. I don't know why anyone would be nostalgic for it. Uh, I think it's very good that the anti-Soviet forces won the Cold War in world history, but this is not a new Cold War. But I would say in a sense of, from a political science perspective and from a diplomat's perspective, in terms of course of diplomacy between the United States and China and its United States allies and its partners in China, this is more complicated, not worse, but more complicated than the Cold War in one very important sense. And that is that in the second half of the Cold War, from the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis to the end of the Cold War, there was one incredibly stabilizing factor in international politics, security politics. And that was that the two camps, the anti-Soviet camp and the Soviet camp, knew where the lines were between the two camps. And they were largely accepted. You knew where the Warsaw Pact ended and where NATO began. You knew where NATO ended and where the Warsaw Pact began. And what this means is that aggression across the accepted boundaries between the two sides would have been clearly identified by both sides and the reactions probably would have been very harsh. Because those lines were clear, everyone would know what aggression looked like. And there was a nuclear world, so this lent to stable nuclear deterrence because who wanted to be the aggressor when they could potentially unleash nuclear Armageddon as things escalated across clear boundaries. And the problem in East Asia is that there are no clear boundaries in these maritime disputes. So if I go back to this picture, the second picture, by the way, this is just an outline of the Senkaku Diaoyu dispute. If someone wants to go back to that, we can, we can do that in the Q&A. This is the, the nine dash line, the South China Sea. The problem is that all of the actors there seem to believe that their claims are legitimate. And I include the Chinese in this. This is important because they all feel like they're on the defensive. They're all defending what they believe is justifiably theirs against other claimants. Why is this important? I'm a social scientist, I'm a political scientist, right? Most of social science isn't really science, but some of it is. And this really is. This is something called prospect theory. It won the Nobel Prize for my colleague at Princeton, Daniel um, Kahneman, and his co-author, Amos Tversky, who unfortunately passed away before the prize. You can't get it posthumously. And the theory is a, a simple one for our purposes here, and that is that people will take bigger risks and pay higher costs to defend what they believe is theirs than they will to get new stuff. This is across gender, across culture, across age groups, and it's been shown in laboratories to be true. So that's why I say it's science. There are exceptions, of course, people like Hitler. But thank God they're exceptions. Right? But most people will take bigger risks and pay higher costs to defend what they believe is really theirs than they will to get new stuff. So why does this bother me? It bothers me because I've talked to diplomats from all the disputant countries in the past except for Brunei. For some reason, I've never met a diplomat from Brunei and talked about this at the same time. And all of them seem to sincerely believe that their claims are real, including the Chinese diplomats. So what that means 
is that they're more willing to run risks and pay costs to defend what they believe is rightfully theirs than they otherwise would be. And some people say, is China revisionist in the South China Sea? And the people are surprised when they say, I wish. In other words, if they were making new claims that they hadn't made since the 1930s, it would be easier to deter China from using force to enforce those claims than if they really believe it's been there since the 1930s and they finally have the power to do something about it. That's going to be a diff more difficult challenge. And the same with Japan. I don't know any Japanese citizens on the full spectrum who don't believe the Senkaku Islands are Japanese. Most Chinese I talk to believe the Diaoyu Islands, the same islands that they call it, are theirs, historically, et cetera. That's really dangerous. That's much more dangerous than if China was saying, oh, we never had the Diaoyu Islands, but let's get them. Because that would be easier to deter. That would be them getting something new. And that's what I worry about. And that's what makes it more complicated than the Cold War. Now, there's another factor that's more complicated, and that is the risk of escalation. And I'll go back to the main map. The United States military, since the end of the Cold War, has operated with a kind of uh, standard uh, operating procedure or a standard strategy, which is when it projects power abroad against a potential foe or an actual foe, what it does is very early in a conflict, it cripples the ability of that foe to reach out and damage and hurt forward deployed US forces. And it does that by taking out weapon systems, by taking out radars, et cetera. Right? The problem in this case is that no American president has ever launched a massive early strike against a nuclear power in a conventional crisis or in a conventional war. And China is a nuclear power. And a lot of the capabilities that China can use, as I described to you in detail for a reason, are based on the mainland of China that would be used in a conventional sense to reach out and try to strike forward deployed US forces. And what makes things worse, and there's a reason I described the nuclear forces to you in some detail, is that China is the first challenger to American military uh, power that has combined in the same types of systems a conventional deterrent and a nuclear deterrent. The Soviet Union didn't have conventionally tipped ballistic missiles. China does. China also has conventionally tipped nuclear missiles. And China has put its nuclear deterrent on submarines when it has based a lot of its naval deterrent against the US forward deployed forces on conventional weapons on submarines. What does this mean? If conflict were to happen and the United States were to try to protect forward deployed US forces, they would probably want to, or they would probably consider, I can't say want to because it's a presidential decision, way above my pay grade. They would want to consider taking out some of those capabilities, either the command and control for those capabilities or the actual weapon systems. It might be difficult for a future Chinese leader to know that those types of strikes weren't designed to take away the nuclear deterrent as well. And that has real potential escalatory implications for a US-China shooting war. So I raised all, those, uh, all that equipment for a reason. Now, China has a no first use policy, but I've written articles elsewhere looking at internal Chinese documents that we're not supposed to see, but you can get on the outside world. I didn't get them when I was in the US government. I would never be able to publish anything like that. But you can get them in libraries uh, outside of China that suggest the no first use policy is more of a guideline than a rule. So an American president would have to think, will it really hold if I use a conventional strike against these assets on the mainland? Might China respond with a nuclear attack against our allies or against the United States? So they'd have to consider that at least in the future. Another problem for the US is that almost all of US regional allies and partners uh, are economically dependent on relations with China which will make them reluctant to get into a kind of Cold War, which is, you know, I, I don't want a Cold War, but it's a reality that the United States has to think hard about who will be with them in a struggle against China. And it will probably depend on Chinese behavior to a great deal. Um, and then there's domestic politics. And one of the things that makes domestic politics more complicated in this uh, already complicated mess is that uh, since the since the financial crisis of 2008, I believe that China, the People's Republic of China, has been more confident abroad and less confident. The Chinese Communist Party has been less confident at home 
since 2008. Now, I'm a political scientist, so two, we love two by two tables. Right? This is real science for us, right? You have two variables, you have a two by two table. The worst cell in the two by two table is a China that is confident abroad and scared at home from a US perspective and from the perspective of US allies. Because it means they're more likely to assert themselves on these long-term claims because they're confident the US shot itself in the foot in the financial crisis, China feels stronger. And they're more likely to react harshly to the behavior of other disputants. And it's not always China that picks the fight. But they're more likely to react strongly because of the domestic political realities in China and the need to pose the party as a strong defender of Chinese national honor. Now, it's true that Xi Jinping is much more powerful as an individual than his predecessor, Hu Jintao. So maybe this factor is not quite as strong as it was when Hu Jintao was in office. But I would say this about uh, Xi Jinping's leadership. It has based its leadership on a highly nationalistic set of slogans, the China dream and the rejuvenation of this Chinese nation. And that creates a political environment in China that makes it very hard to be moderate in these types of disputes. And one of the things I'm quite concerned about, and we can talk about in the Q&A, is Taiwan in 2020, when Taiwan has an election again, uh, will the mainland remain patient in cross-strait relations, or will it become aggressive? So it's hard to sustain these slogans, national rejuvenation, China dream, when if you can't defend your map. That's a, that's, a, that's a basic problem. So it worries me that the CCP has moved into this very nationalistic rhetoric to justify its legitimacy at home, in addition to other trends in China that I'm concerned about. There are positive features as well, so don't get too depressed. Um, one is economic interdependence. The economic interdependence in East Asia is very deep. And it's different than economic interdependence before, say, World War I, which realists often cite. It's transnational production chains where products are finished in China, but they're made from parts around the region, Taiwan, South Korea, uh, from, from uh, Japan, uh, sometimes from the United States, assembled on the mainland of China, sent back out to, um, to the United States, to Europe, to Japan, to other markets. Malaysia is a big contributor to this transnational production chain. It's an incredibly productive thing. It's produced tremendous poverty reduction, wealth. You can call it wealth, but I'll call it poverty reduction because that's more important. Hundreds of millions of people have been pulled out of poverty by this phenomenon, but it's very fragile. You have to have real-time delivery of all these products in multiple directions, and a war in the region would be very damaging. And I'm of the opinion that this transnational production chain of which China has been an integral part has been a major force for peace in East Asia in the post-Cold War environment. I find it hard to imagine that none of these conflicts would have erupted into, into arm, any of these, these maritime disputes wouldn't have erupted into conflict if you didn't have this economic incentive of cooperation between the actors involved. And the problem here really is, gets back to the financial crisis and China's reaction to it, is that China has put in place some domestic development goals and plans that have eroded some of that transnational production chain. It's still very strong. But China has tried to replace some of the foreign suppliers into that, into, into that transnational production chain. If that were to progress further long into the future, that would worry me. Under the same thesis that this has been a hidden source of peace, I can't prove it because it's a counterfactual. But if it were to go away, my fear is it's like oxygen. You start to notice it when it's, de it's depleting, when there's not much of it. You notice oxygen very much. When it's very robust, you don't really notice oxygen. And that's true across the Pacific as well. A major ballast in US-China relations has been the economic relationship. And we can talk about the decline in the US-China economic relationship in the Q&A. It's not a thesis, not a, it's not a main core of my current discussion, but it's, it's, a, it's a big problem. And both sides uh, uh, have contributed to it strongly in the, in the last 10 years, and in particular in the last couple of years. OK, there's a second set of security issues. I'll be briefer on these. And that is how to convince China to contribute actively to prevent North Korea or Iran in the future from developing nuclear weapons. This has been a challenge for US diplomats uh, for at least the last 15 years, if not longer, 20 years. 
going back to 1994, actually, in the North Korean case, 1993-94. And the world is simply more globalized than it's ever been before. And even though China is not a peer competitor of the United States, its economy is so large and its institutional position in the UN and elsewhere is so strong that if it doesn't actively contribute to solving these problems, or if it obstructs, worse yet, it'll be extremely difficult to solve these problems. Um, there's a greater need for all major countries to pull together, and China is by far the biggest economic partner of both North Korea and Iran. And China's economy is so big that it is able to, to lend enough support to both the North Korean and Iranian regimes basically on its own, even if the rest of the world pressures those regimes. And people know that about North Korea. Not that many people know that about Iran. But it is true that China is by far the biggest economic partner of Iran in the international space. <clears throat> North Korea. China doesn't support North Korean nuclearization. I believe that. I negotiated with the Chinese on this issue. I believe them. I don't believe they want North Korea to have nuclear weapons. It's not good for China. But China also doesn't want to see the regime in North Korea collapse. And there are a range of international and domestic reasons why the Chinese Communist Party does not want the regime in North Korea to collapse. And I can talk about those in the Q&A. But for the sake of my argument here, please accept that. So the challenge is that China doesn't want a war on the peninsula either because China believes that a war in the peninsula, quite rightly, will lead to the end of the North Korean regime. Plus, there'll be a war in China's neighborhood, so that's kind of the worst outcome. Um, and China knows that it has tremendous leverage on North Korea. You'll hear Chinese scholars and Chinese diplomats say, oh, we don't have that much leverage over North Korea. It's really not true. I've seen it. When China pressures North Korea, North Korea notices. The North Koreans know they need China. And I've seen it in real time. And of course, the Chinese diplomats and scholars say that because they don't want the burden of North Korea on their shoulders. They don't want the world to blame China for North Korea, because North Korea is not China. But at the end of the day, they do have tremendous leverage. But they're uncomfortable being responsible for outcomes in North Korea. Who would be comfortable being responsible <laughs> for outcomes in North Korea? So it's an embarrassing burden. So the United States, to get China to pressure North Korea for denuclearization has to do two opposite things, both of which are hard to do. It has to convince China that if the status quo continues, the current trends continue, things will be worse for China than if they're reversed. And the obvious way to do that and the most dramatic way to do that is to say it will lead to a war. And we all know how a war is going to end up. It'll be really terrible, and the North Korean regime will go down, and you won't have protected it. But short of that, the United States and its allies can say, we are going to do things that you don't like, China, if North Korea continues down its current path, because we have to defend ourselves. We're going to strengthen our alliances, both between the United States and Japan and the United States and South Korea. And we're going to strengthen the alliance, perhaps, if we can, between South Korea and Japan. And on some occasions, South Korea and Japan have tightened their security relations in recent years. And every time, China has reacted very harshly. Because from a Chinese perspective, that's, that's like cats and dogs sleeping together, right? The South Koreans and the Japanese aren't supposed to get along, and China has long tried to avoid a kind of NATO-style US-led alliance in its area. And it, it, the alliances have been largely bilateral. So only North Korea could really bring these actors together, and sometimes North Korea does, and that is very disturbing. So there's another prospect that can make things look very painful from a Chinese perspective if North Korea continues down its current path. It's difficult to threaten war in a credible fashion because war would be so nasty. There are, on any given day, some 250,000 US citizens and dependents that would need to be evacuated. And because of the geography, uh, most of the South Korean population, from a North Korean perspective, is conveniently located really close to the North Korean border. So it's easy to attack. And that's where most of the Americans are as well. So it's very difficult uh, to threaten war. That doesn't mean it can't be done, but it's very difficult to threaten war. Um, and it's very difficult to sustain South Korean-Japanese cooperation. So this is a real challenge 
from the threat part of the equation. Now there's an assurance part of the equation as well, because I remind you that I said China doesn't want the North Korean regime to collapse. So a second thing the United States has to do in, in convincing China to pressure North Korea is to say the United States can live peacefully with a denuclearized North Korean regime. In my opinion, that's harder for the United States to credibly state than to credibly threaten conflict, military conflict. The United States has a long record, I would call it a bipartisan fetish for regime change. Right? It's not a Republican thing. I worked in the Bush administration, people think of Iraq, but it's much more than that. It's Libya, it's Ukraine, um, it's President Obama's initial reaction to the civil war in Syria, Assad has to go. China doesn't like regime change politics. China doesn't want the regime to change in North Korea, so the United States needs to break from its tradition and traditional diplomacy in negotiating with China over North Korea and to say we're not seeking regime change, we're simply seeking denuclearization. The same could be said for Iran negotiations. I don't have time to go into those, but the same could be said for those as well back in the Obama administration days. But it's a very difficult thing for the United States to credibly commit to. And I would say that until the Singapore summit of June of this year, the Trump administration did a very good job of those two things. It appeared ready to go to war over the North Korean nuclear and missile programs. And many people in East Asia and experts in the United States were quite concerned in late 2017 that there could be a war on the Korean Peninsula, despite the heavy costs. Um, and I believe the Chinese were worried there was going to be a war on the Korean Peninsula if things didn't change. And the second thing the Trump administration has done is it has constantly conveyed that it's not seeking regime change in North Korea, very publicly. Not just the president saying he gets along really well with the North Korean dictator, but the State Department and other agencies conveying the idea this is not about regime change. It's not our business. And I think the Trump administration, unlike earlier administrations, has more credibility because it has projected this kind of studied indifference to the life of people outside the borders of the United States. So it's more credible on that score. I'm not, say, I I'm not saying I support that conveyance of an emotion. I'm just saying it's more credible on the score of saying, we don't, you know, it's North Korea. We don't live there. We just don't want them to have weapons that threaten us. And I think that's why China did pressure North Korea much more than it had in the past, because those two things were achieved. Then I think at the summit, we lost a lot of that leverage. We lost that leverage, in my opinion, by declaring victory prematurely, saying we've largely solved the problem, now we just need to talk to the North Koreans. And I told you before that the Chinese government, the officials, and to some degree the Chinese academics and the Chinese people, they feel this burden, that North Korea is a burden. Well, President Trump invited them to take that burden and put it right on America's shoulders. Now we can talk it out. Okay, you talk it out. <laughs> and lo and behold, if the Trump administration's right, I'm not basing this on any kind of classified information, if the Trump administration's right, not unsurprisingly, China reduced the economic pressure on North Korea soon thereafter and said, oh, just reassure them now. But that means the United States has less leverage because the United States doesn't have good economic relations with North Korea or Iran, so the United States can't pressure Iran or North Korea without China. It's impossible. I've spoken for too long, and there is the Iran issue. Should, should I say five minutes about Iran, or should I end? I don't know how long I've gone. I don't see a clock, and I am an academic, and I can talk forever. Um, um, so the blame, just on the North Korea thing, one last sentence, which is the Trump administration now says uh, that China has reduced pressure on North Korea because of the trade war. I don't think the trade war has helped, but I don't think that's the reason. I think if there weren't a trade war and the United States declared victory in Singapore, China would have reduced pressure anyway on North Korea. But the trade war doesn't help. And we can talk about the trade war in the Q&A if you like, but that's not, again, not the focus of my talk. So Iran, and this does worry me, and I think this is gonna feed into the trade war, and that is that China is the biggest economic partner of Iran in the world. It was before the JCPOA, the Iran nuclear deal that was negotiated by the Obama administration. And the way that the Obama administration was able to get China to pressure Iran was through what Americans call secondary sanctions. They were never leveled against 
the Chinese, but they were out there as a threat. And what secondary sanctions are is an American foreign policy tool that says if you country C, third country C, have good relations with a country we don't like, country B, we country A will sanction you, country C. <laughs> the Chinese and some other countries believe this is illegal under international law to sanction a third party for its relations with a second party that is not harming the sanctioning state itself directly. But the United States has done this for a long time in Cuba. It's done it in Iran. And it's going to do it, I think, next year when it's disappointed, if and when it's disappointed. I hope I'm wrong. I hope that the Trump administration makes a huge progress on North Korea. It would be great for the, for the United States. It would be great for China. It would be great for the world. But I have my doubts. And I'm saying if things go bad on North Korea, the United States is probably going to go to secondary sanctions on Chinese firms that deal with North Korea. But those firms tend to be relatively small, and they don't have a big international footprint. In Iran, these are big Chinese firms. They're energy firms. They're banks. And if the United States starts going after them, having unilaterally pulled out of the Iran deal, which China helped negotiate, why? Because it was worried that its energy companies would get caught up in those secondary sanctions. It reduced energy purchases from Iran from 2012 to 2014, avoiding the secondary sanctions. But it really helped put the squeeze on Iran that got Iran to the table. And then Chinese diplomats, I'm told, from people involved were very constructive in helping cut a deal. Now the United States has pulled out of that deal and it's now going to sanction Iran for a whole range of Iranian behaviors, which I personally think are quite reprehensible and destabilizing. I'm not complaining about the notion that these things are bad behaviors by Iran in the international sphere, but it's kind of open-ended from a Chinese perspective. And you're going to see the United States, I believe, in the early part of next year, sanctioning Chinese companies for dealing with Iran. And that's going to feed into the trade war that already exists. And that's going to make it worse, in my opinion. And it's one of the reasons I don't think we're going to get out of this trade war anytime soon. And it's a factor that a lot of people who don't do international security politics haven't taken into account. So North Korea, to a lesser degree, Iran, to a major degree, you're going to see secondary sanctions, I believe, from the United States against Chinese entities for their cooperation with these targets of American course of diplomacy. Um, I really have spoken for too long. I really appreciate your attention. Um, again, I'm really fine. I mean, there's even people sitting on the steps. I feel bad for you that you have to sit on the steps. But um, it's a Friday evening, and I'm just uh, incredibly honored to be here in any case. But I'm particularly honored that so many people came out, and I don't see anyone asleep. Um, <laughs> And uh, again, thanks to Steve. And uh, way to go, uh, SOAS, and way to go, University of London, for getting Steve Sang here. You've really scored a major win uh, for the university. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tom, um, for your wonderful lecture. Before I move this to the discussion period, um, I noticed that there are at least 20 and possibly more people sitting on the steps. It's a good time for you to get yourself a seat. There are plenty of seats in the front, and there are also other seats elsewhere. So if you like to move, feel free to do so now. I think if you do that, others may well be moving, adjusting to enable you to sit comfortably. And there are a few seats on this side as well, so by all means, come over. Right, we have about 36 minutes for discussions. Let me 
kickstart this first, and then I'll open it uh, to the floor. Tom, I think you have made a lot of very interesting and important observations that I think many people would like to follow up on. I myself actually very torn between whether I should ask you about Iran or about North Korea, but having noticed that we actually have a very strong representation of expertise in the Middle East in this room as well, so I will probably leave the, the Middle East to others. Good. <laughs> Every day I was at the State Department when I had a really bad day, I say, well, I don't work on the Middle East. <laughs> <laughs> Well, here we deal with them all and deal with the Middle East on a daily basis, perhaps not in the same way that the State Department. But, but let me say one thing, Steve, just as a side note, that my first week on the job as Deputy Assistant Secretary for China, Taiwan, and Mongolia, the first crisis was in Lebanon. It was July of 2016, and the Northeast Asia, the, the, um, the NEA, uh, Near East uh, Affairs Bureau people were in my office telling me about Lebanon because there had been an Israeli airstrike in Lebanon and Chinese peacekeepers had been killed. And there was an evacuation issue where Chinese were at risk along with Americans. And I had to deal with that problem as my first thing. And it was a real wake-up call. Like, it's not just East Asia. It's China. It's the whole world. So China it does have, in the diplomatic sphere and in the peacekeeping sphere, it has a global footprint. It's everywhere. Absolutely. <laughs> Let me then ask you about North Korea. I mean, I think what you said about North Korea is very interesting and important. But where do you see the next step in North Korea in terms of what the Chinese will do, and in terms of how the Trump administration can get things back on track. I think you highlighted the importance of how declaring victories too soon really was a very um, ill-advised move on the part of... Well, everything in this discussion is my opinion, not the opinion of anybody else. But, uh, you know, I do think that declaring victory too early will reduce leverage on North Korea to comply with any vague commitment that it may have made in those private meetings. Um, it seems to me that this week, and as recently as Thursday, the Trump administration is still declaring major progress. Um, I hope they're right. You know, I. I would much rather be wrong intellectually about this issue and have the Trump administration win major kudos for settling the problem. I just don't understand the problem in that way that um, the United States will continue to keep enough leverage, enough pressure on North Korea to actually make concrete progress, which I do believe is possible on de denuclearization if the United States says we're doing extremely well and we're, getting, we're making real progress without the concrete progress already being delivered, in large part because I think China is such an important player in this. And China has been so reluctant to really pressure North Korea. And when the United States says things like that, China quickly moves back to more normal relations with the country. So what would happen if we were to get China to pressure North Korea again? Would there have to be real disappointment in the United States? I don't think that that's extremely unlikely. And then the United States would have to go back to some of its earlier policies, which quite frankly were scary to a lot of people, including our South Korean allies, and were scary to China. Um, so I don't know if that's going to happen. I hope it doesn't have to happen. I hope the Trump administration has the golden key and has unlocked the North. Um, but I have my doubts. Having dealt with this problem in the six-party talks as part of the U.S. delegation, I just have my doubts that, they've, that, that it's solved, or it's basically solved, and now it's just a question of the details. Um, I doubt it. I hope I'm wrong. Thank you. The floor is opened. Um, if you ex uh, say in one phrase sentence who you are so that uh, the speaker has a sense of where the question may be coming from, it would be helpful. Yes, sir, you have your hands up. There's a roving microphone that will come to you. Yeah, my name's uh, Yao Ming. I'm actually a chartered accountant by profession, but I do... You're a what by profession? Uh, an accountant. Accountant, wow. Yeah. But I do transparency. have a Transparency, it's all about transparency. Yeah, <laughs> yeah definitely, and accountability, yeah. <laughs> um, my question is this. There's been talk about, um, you know, certain European countries um, trying to get exemptions from secondary sanctions. Yeah. Um, how likely is that going to happen and how, you know, what would be the optics of it, really? Okay, thanks. That's a great question. I can't speak for the Trump administration. I'm not in the Trump administration, right? So I can't speak for it. 
My guess is that Euro some European countries, some US allies will get exemptions from things like the aluminum and steel tariffs. I have my doubts that European countries are gonna get exemptions from Iran. This seems like a core security goal of this administration to weaken Iran, to punish Iran, to stop, change Iran's behavior. How many behaviors will be enough? I don't know. It, it was cleaner when it was all about nuclear weapons. You know, you knew what the, the boundaries of the problem were. Um, if it's all Iranian behavior, Iran is such a destabilizing actor, it could go on for a long time. The Trump administration takes it extremely seriously. Um, and I would expect them to sanction countries, regardless of whether they were allies or not who were dealing with Iran and under those circumstances. Whether that will work or not is an open question. Um, and whether it will work with China is an open question. Yes, the lady there, please. Um, thank you for the fascinating talk. Um, I'm a PhD student from um, Ch Lao China Institute at King's College London. Oh, nice. So, um, my daughter studied there. <laughs> <laughs> so my question is regarding um, the depth track diplomacy and um, the expanding Chinese military um, projection, power projection capabilities. So um, the, in terms of the depth threat diplomacy, um, the Belt and Road Initiative, especially um, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank and the uh, China Export ba uh, Import Bank um, and the China Development Bank has been considered as, um, um, they, they are economic institutions. However, in, um, in terms of lending to um, to poor countries, to de developing countries, um, China is actually taking advantages from the uh, from those loans um, given out, and um, so with those countries unable to to return to uh, we repay the China um, leases of, of um, ports will be signed to China, and there are there have been. Uh, situations that, uh, especially in Sri Lanka and um, Djibouti and Ma Maldives, where the ports has become um, just Chinese. What was the third one? Two bases, Maldives, the Mal Ma Maldives. Ma Maldives, Maldives. Yes, okay. Maldives. Um, so, um, well, from the Chinese Colonel Joe Bo in, he said, um, China, the Chinese military is no, in nowhere intention to impose the strain of pros tactics and um, having Chinese military bases overseas. So I was just wondering what you okay. on that. <clears throat> it's a great question. Uh, the, BR, the BRI is such a broad program. It looks to me, I studied the 1950s, my first book in China, uh, where campaign politics in the Chinese Communist Party, they would announce a big campaign and everybody would rally around the campaign, including a disastrous one in the Great Leap Forward. Uh, the One Belt, One Road, or the Belt and Road Initiative, kind of looks like a campaign, a Chinese Communist Party campaign. The great leader has announced that this is the goal of the country and everybody has to find a way to contribute. So what it's probably gonna do is create a lot of bad loans, a lot of bad investments because politically driven economics usually doesn't work out very well. Um, and there are different, fa different aspects of the One Belt, One Road. Since everything falls under it, you have to break it into parts. The AIB, uh, the Infrastructure Bank, I think is a very constructive use of Chinese uh, reserves. Uh, literally constructive, that's not a pun, right? It's constructive use of Chinese reserves. And I think from a US perspective, it should be considered a constructive use of Chinese reserves because uh, as you, the previous questioner was an accountant, because it's an international institution with a much higher degree of transparency than the rest of One Belt, One Road, and it has taken most of its projects to date in cooperation with other long-standing international institutions like the Asia Development Bank, like the World Bank, and even the European Bank of, uh, of um, oh, jammy. Um, Reconstruction and Development. Wow, I used to study the early 40s, the late 40s. Um, the European Bank of Reconstruction and Development where a friend of mine works in London and I just visited him today. So, um, AIB has coordinated with uh, these, these banks which have high degrees of transparency and there's a lot of oversight because a lot of other countries are involved. Then there's the rest of One Belt, One Road, which is more bilateral, has been encouraged politically to take off. So I'd expect a lot of banks to make all sorts of loans to be politically impressive. That doesn't mean they're necessarily gonna be good. One of the things I'm concerned about in my country is the discussion of One Belt, One Road sometimes is internally illogical. 
If the Chinese make loans that make the Chinese wealthier, people worry. And they say everybody's benefiting from these loans, so China will get political leverage. If China makes bad loans, people worry, <laughs> right? Because they say it's debt trap diplomacy. I don't think the Chinese want to make a bunch of bad loans with $1.3 trillion. That's just my guess, right? The accountant probably agrees with me. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> the accountant probably agrees with me. $1.3 trillion in bad loans is really expensive. And it's not clear to me that bad loans will win a lot of China's friends and allies in the future. You might be, if you're, even if you're giving bribery to a small percentage of the population, corrupt officials, that doesn't win you hearts and minds over the long run. So I, I would hope that the international community would encourage China to make good loans that are beneficial to the target for reasons that, are, that it's a globalized economy and everyone could benefit from this, to discourage bad corrupt loans, obviously, because they're destabilizing. That can lead to instability, which could hurt us as well. And should encourage things like the AIB, which are multilateral, rather than the bilateral ones. But there's a tendency to be opposed to all of it. Now, you mentioned Sri Lanka. I'll have to, I'll have to address things quickly. I promised Steve I wouldn't go on forever with every answer. Sri Lanka is the, the example that everybody uses. It was a loan that Sri Lankans couldn't repay. And Sri Lanka gave China a 99-year lease. And if you know Chinese history, that should set off all sorts of alarm bells in your head. <laughs> Right? A 99-year lease. It's pretty ham-fisted diplomacy, if you ask me. But it is the only real example to date of a port being secured through, bad, through a bad loan. And Sri Lanka was under sanctions from the United States and the EU because of human rights abuses in the Civil War. They turned to China. Sri Lanka is not a great place to invest, apparently. I'm not shocked by that. And uh, they couldn't repay the loans. Um, so. Djibouti, you know, China has a Navy port in Djibouti. It's part of that anti-piracy campaign. And I heard Americans say, well, maybe China will use the ports in Djibouti to drive the American, um, American base in Djibouti out. But I don't see it that way. My understanding of the American base in Djibouti is that it's largely for counterterrorism against al-Shabaab, against Boko Haram. Why does China want to stop the United States from fighting terrorists in Africa when China's investing so much in Africa? <laughs> I don't see, I, I, I guess I don't, I don't instantly see everything as a zero-sum game. I need to be convinced if it's a zero-sum game. And I don't see this. But, you know, from the Indian perspective, the Sri Lanka thing is a concern. And unfortunately, from India's perspective, Sri Lanka is very far from China. It's very close to India. So they ought to be able to create counters. And that's great power politics. Um, but I, I, I'm a little bit less concerned as I'm conveying, and I'm a little bit confused about some of the rhetoric. The way you get political power through the use of money is to give deals that are more beneficial to the target than the market would allow. That's standard Alfred Hirschman. So you don't make friends and in, you don't gain influence by hurting the target. So our, the language in America is now about predatory loans and all this stuff. That's not how China's going to gain influence. We should be more concerned if you're worried about a zero-sum power struggle if China's making beneficial loans. Because that's how they'll win friends, not predatory loans. Anyway, that's, that's my political science response to your excellent question. Thank, thank you, Tom. I think we've got um, plenty of interest, so if we could all keep our questions on... Uh... I will try to keep the answer short. I can go on forever, as you can tell. They, they let, they let uh, academics into the government, but then, you know, maybe they shouldn't. <laughs> well, we are always for academics. Uh, I have uh, Hassan there first, and then I'll uh, go around. Okay. Yes, uh, Hassan. I was going to <laughs> thank Steve for ensuring that uh, uh, the neocon uh, interpretation of uh, world politics gets good airing in SWA, something that we don't often get exposed to, especially on a Friday night. So thank you, Steve. But I realized really... Am in, I a neocon? Well, you know, I'm going to explain why I think some of your analysis actually is to the right of neocons. If, if, if I'm to the right of neocons, okay. Especially when it comes to the Middle East, and that's what I want to okay. uh, pick up issues with. In an earlier, in a response to an earlier question, you said you would support the USA uh, imposing sanctions on countries that have bad behavior, including allies. I want to ask you whether... I didn't support it, I described it. Well, I said I, that will happen because my understanding is that Trump administration puts great value 
on its pressuring of Iran and that I don't believe they will give exemptions. What I heard that was you would support imposing sanctions on countries that behave badly, even if they are allies. And I was going to ask mm -hmm. you, would that include Saudi Arabia for its bad behavior in imprisoning uh, the Lebanese prime minister last November in Riyadh for its reported gruesome killing of uh, the, uh, the Saudi dissident Khashoggi, although facts are not yet verified, but by, by what we hear coming from the USA, it seems uh, he has been murdered in the Saudi uh, embassy or consulate in, in, in Istanbul, and also for uh, committing war crimes in Yemen. Would you go as far as uh, supporting introduction of sanctions on a US ally such as Saudi Arabia? Okay. But my second question on Iran, let me, because these are related. Hassan, Hassan you, you, if I may, I think we can yeah. okay. questions. So. Yeah. Right, my main question was on okay, Iran, I, but I, I, can, I can answer another question later from you, it's fine. But I'll okay, answer sure. this one. First of all, I, I, did, I, I was asked a question about whether the Trump administration would give allies an exemption on secondary sanctions towards Iran. This is a futuristic question, because it's really about what would happen in the future and probably early next year. And my sense is no, it won't, right? That's my answer. Uh, it's an intellectual answer. Um, I have some issues, I could list the issues of uh, US uh, policy problems with managing allies. I believe in a global competition, not a zero sum struggle, but we're in a competition with China. In a competition with China, the greatest US asset is our friends and allies. We have some 60 plus uh, uh, security partners with, with signed agreements. China has North Korea. It has maybe Pakistan as an, uh, an unallied partner. It has Sudan, Zimbabwe, a rogues gallery. This is the greatest strength. So if you mismanage your alliances, that's gonna cost us a lot. And I worry that we're not paying enough attention to that important aspect of US power around the world. Um, I object to titles, neocon, other things. I don't find them very constructive. I've never, even joined a political party, but I certainly don't see myself as having a title. So I don't know how to answer a question of whether I'm a neocon or to the right of a neocon. Um, so I'll just skip that piece. And I don't know how US pressure or lack thereof on human rights violations in Saudi Arabia touches upon my answer to the question about Iran. Um, it's quite possible that the Trump administration will not sanction Saudi Arabia under the theory that Iran is so important to US foreign policy and the pressuring of Iran is so important to US foreign policy that they will choose not to pressure Saudi Arabia on things that run against US values. Um, I wouldn't be shocked if that were the case. Um, and I don't really think it's my place here. I didn't come here to talk about US human rights policy towards the Middle East or US human rights policy towards Saudi Arabia. So I don't wanna spend time talking about which offense by Saudi officials would should or would trigger U.S. sanctions against Saudi Arabia, which is a long-term ally of the United States, for sure. So I'll just, I'll leave it at that. Okay. I'll take one from this side, please. And then I'll try to get back to... Good evening, sir. Um, I did economics from Cambridge, and I'm currently doing Japanese in SOAS. And there is one question that kind of really puzzles me: that why does the you know why does the states feel so strongly that North Korea is China's responsibility or burden in your speech? Wouldn't it also be logical to view it as a leftover issue from the Cold War? And I mean, China is not a regional hegemon in Asia, unlike you know, US is in her own backyard. So, I mean, you know, it's really, you know, also China views a country's sovereignty as really the top issue of any sovereign state. So I'm just wondering why is the general assumption that we should feel so strongly responsible for North Korea's doing? Thank okay, you. It's, a, it's a great question. Um, <clears throat> if you go back to historical legacies, um, I would say, if you put it in Chinese, meo xin zhongguo, meo bei chao shen. So if you want to talk about Cold War legacies, it's, uh, there was no 
new China, no PRC, there would be no North Korea. They wouldn't have survived. Uh, China saved North Korea. It restored North Korea. It supported North Korea. And North Korea now exists on its own, and it's a big nuisance for China. I'm not trying to portray this as you know, a close alliance that China loves North Korea and loves everything it does. I think China is very frustrated, as I said, with North Korea. But at the end of the day, the North Korean regime is entirely dependent on its economic relationship with China, both directly and indirectly. Directly because of the official economic relationship, and indirectly through a lot of the many, many illegal activities that North Korea does on the international stage to fund itself has to go through somewhere, and it's only logical geographically that that would occur through China. So it's just the reality. It's an unfortunate reality for China. It's an embarrassment to a lot of Chinese scholars and elites that I've talked to that they're left with this historical legacy that you're correct is a historical legacy. But it's the only peaceful way to deal with denuclearization of North Korea. And my boss, Chris Hill, uh, when I was in the six party talks, had a line that I always remember when he was talking to his Chinese counterparts about North Korean nuclear weapons. He said, I'd rather see a toddler with a hand grenade than that regime with nuclear weapons. And I don't think the Chinese government, as I said before, wants North Korea to have nuclear weapons, but it has this dilemma. So is it the responsibility? Well, if you have the leverage and it's a problem that threatens your security, directly and indirectly, then yeah, I think they have the in incentive, the interest in trying to help. And the, the, I think the alternative, a, North, a, a secure North Korean nuclear deterrent over the long run and a declared nu nuclear state in North Korea is going to be a disaster for the region and a disaster for China. And then the last piece is, yeah, there's a principle of non-interference in the sovereignty of affairs. But tell that to the South Koreans when they built a missile defense against North Korean missiles. <laughs> And China sanctioned South Korea. So it's not always the case that China doesn't push against other countries when they do things that China doesn't like. So please, you know, I'd just say please to the Chinese government, push against North Korea more. And when you do it, produce results. They went to Singapore. I think the Chinese rightfully deserved a lot of credit for that. And the Trump administration gave China a lot of credit for that because China increased the pressure, North Korea noticed, and they started to negotiate again. I'll take a question from the other uh, side first. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, hi there. Uh, my name is Jack Broom. I'm a security analyst focusing on East Asia. Uh, I wanted to ask about uh, Xinjiang. We haven't heard uh, much mm -hmm. about that yet today. Um, uh, there's been uh, a lot in the news about securitization in Xinjiang, uh, but not yet uh, much has been spoken from, from governments, in, uh, particularly in the West. Uh, I wondered if you see, on the one hand, it being used uh, for benefit by the U.S. and other countries, uh, being subsumed under the uh, narrative of the war on terror in the same way the Second Chechen War was partly used and gained support for uh, Russia uh, in that case, or whether you see it as uh, uh, used negatively in things like the trade. Yeah, I, I don't see this kind of passivity that you're describing, and I think the problem, I don't know if everyone heard question is about Xinjiang and about, I guess, the re-education camps that you're talking about. Uh, yes. But okay, so, so th that's something that runs, you know, against what the United States is all about, you know, which is based on freedom of religion because a lot of the people that came over from Europe were re religious refugees. Um, so it runs against American values, what's happening in Xinjiang. I don't believe the United States government has been quiet about it. I don't think the European governments have been quiet about it. Um, then the second part of the question was about whether the war on terror uh, somehow reduces criticism on these scores. I don't think so at all, because um, a systematic re-education campaign of Muslims is a very different thing than targeting terrorism, which is a very small minority. Uh, if, it's if it's Islamic fundamentalist terrorism you're after, it's a very small minority of Muslims around the world who are involved in those activities. So that would not be either a smart or a legitimate approach to countering that problem to try to re-educate large groups of youths away from Islam. So um, no, I don't, I don't think that that's been a factor. And I can say when I was in the government, when uh, the George W. Bush administration was there, it wasn't a factor. We raised human rights concerns over, over Xinjiang, even as we did recognize, and this is important, and I'll, I have to add this, and I was criticized in the United States for raising this, that China does have a terrorism problem. China has a terrorism problem, but it doesn't mean everybody who's upset about 
Beijing's policies in Xinjiang is a terrorist. But China does have a terrorism. I, I saw it. I think it was real. And there are, there are people from China fighting in Syria. And there, there were people in China fighting in Afghanistan. So there is an issue. The question is, how do you deal with the issue? I don't think my country always deals with it right. I've been critical of my own country and how we've dealt with it. I think this way is really not only wrong-headed from a strategic point of view, but it's ethically you know, unsupportable. It's, it's totally wrong. Um, so, uh, and that's just, a, you know, it's bad for China. It's bad for everybody. I think they're going to end up with a much worse problem if they continue down this path, which I take no joy in. I don't see our relationship with China is a zero-sum game. What's bad for China is not good for the United States. And if, they, if this turns out to be very bad for China, it'll be bad for everybody. That's my view. Thank you. I think, let me take one from the, uh, uh, my right-hand cluster there. Yes, yes, sir. yes, you. And then I'll get somebody from the back. Uh, hello, I'm a, a final year student uh, studying Chinese and international relations here at SOAS. Um, my question concerns uh, perceptions of China's rise. Uh, so at the beginning of your talk, uh, you referred to China uh, and you mentioned about it being a global rival and how you didn't think this was one of the big issues. Um, a peer competitor, yeah, I don't think it's a peer, it's not strong enough. Sure, like there was no evidence to support that and militarily, <laughs> diplomatically. Um, yet there are some academics um, Kishor Mabubani, uh, former Singaporean di diplomat, uh, being one of them, who would claim that uh, some American politicians and academics uh, have a sense of uh, nearsightedness, or a, he, he calls it America's myopia um, regarding China's rise. I wear glasses. <laughs> Yeah, he, he, he refers to questions such as what happens when America becomes the number two economic power and what happens when the Chinese currency replaces the, uh, the primary, inter becomes the primary international reserve currency. Um, so my question is, um, do you think or are some uh, American politicians and academics uh, guilty of being too complacent about China's rise or is, or is that just an exaggeration? Okay, it's a great question. So let me t take the last part first. I hope I didn't sound complacent about the importance of China's rise. I think China's rise has global implications through these international institutions and the global pressure campaigns on certain actors like Iran and North Korea. And I think China's importance in East Asia, which is important to the whole globe, makes its current rise quite challenging, even though I don't see it as a peer competitor around the world. I don't expect US and Chinese naval ships to be fighting in the, at the Straits of Hormuz or anything like that anytime soon, right? Um, and some Americans really believe that China's already risen and it's already a peer competitor and it's coming after us all over the world. And when it invests in Africa, it's part of a Cold War strategy of China against the United States. I don't see it that way. And I can talk about those other aspects like uh, Chinese investment in Africa and, Latin America as well. I don't see it all as a big Cold War zero-sum struggle. But I take China's rise extremely seriously. But, you know, I, I know Kishore Mabubani is an old friend. I rarely agree with him on these things. Um, so maybe I have myopia because I have the glasses on. But uh, uh, China's economy is likely to be larger in purchase power parity than the United States economy sometime soon. But that doesn't make China economically more powerful than the United States. And there's a, there's a book that maybe goes further than I would. I've been reading it. I read it on the plane over here by Michael Beckley called Unrivaled about US power. And I'd encourage you to look at that. And there he looks at net economic power, not just GDP, because it's really GDP where China could surpass the United States. Just think of it. They have 1.3 billion people to feed. So even if the GDP is larger, it doesn't mean they have projectable economic power like the United States does which has, in 2012 terms, which is the last time I looked at the PPP equivalent, the most generous interpretation of Chinese per capita GNP and the standard one for US. US was like, six times larger. That's power, that's power projection economic power because you're not consuming it all. And then if you look at the environmental problems, the banking problems, and the banking problems in China are really severe. Chinese officials say it. I'm not casting aspersions. Chinese officials know they need financial reform. They're scared to do it. They say this, right? 
So the idea that the Chinese currency anytime soon is going to become the standard currency around the world, I don't see it. I don't worry about that. I worry that, I actually worry more that China's banking system will collapse. I don't think it will happen. But I, I say to my you know, Chinese colleagues and stuff, that everyone thinks the United States wants to do in China, right? I said, if China were to collapse internally, that would be a huge disaster. And I worked in the State Department. There's no office for that. <laughs> There's no office for Chinese collapse. We wouldn't know what to do. You know, proliferation of weapons, migration and mass, disease control. It would be a disaster for everybody. So I always say we wish China well, but part of wishing China well, in my opinion, is hoping for economic reform and political reform. I don't see why Chinese are, are different and they don't deserve to have a vote in their government. I, I don't understand that. I don't accept it. I think it's almost, and I hear some Americans say it, well, it's different, different culture. They don't get, they, they don't need democracy. Democracy doesn't, well, it just sounds racist to me. <laughs> why shouldn't they have a say in their government? And I'm not, you know, I, I have lots of Chinese friends who believe they should have a say in their government. So it's not an American fetish. Right. Thank you. Um, we got about six minutes left. I'll try to, if possible, take in two. I take one um, at, the, at the far end there, and then yes, please. Yeah. Oh. Well. Yeah, that's fine. All right, I'll do that first. Um, well, I'm a first, a uh, second year PhD student from here. I saw as China. Institute, and I'm more interested in China's domestic politics. As you mentioned before, there's like contradictory phenomenon that with China's economic boom and the increasing military might, that China is getting like more confident about itself. But you mentioned that the party is getting less confident. So my question, the first question is, I mean, how you, I mean, in your opinion, how you understand this kind of less security from the party? And the second question is how this uh, would Let's just stick to one, please. It's a good question. It's a, it's a good enough one on its own. I promise you that. All right. Okay. So, um, yeah, I think since the financial crisis, China has been less confident at home. I think it's, it's manifested itself in various ways. Um, and it's a shame uh, because, again, instability in China is not something that uh, anybody should wish. Uh, certainly, the Chinese Communist Party doesn't like instability, but it's hard to explain if the Chinese Communist Party is not concerned about stability at home, it's hard to explain uh, a bunch of things. This sweep of the anti-corruption drive that Xi Jinping launched under a speech that he made that said, if we don't clean up this corruption problem, the party will go down. So again, that's not an American analysis, that's the analysis of the top leader of China. If we don't clean up corruption, we will not survive as a party. Maybe that's true, but that suggests a lot of fragility. Then there's been more censorship of the internet, of academia. There's been much more thought control in the last few years than there had been in the period between the mid-1990s and 2008, before the financial crisis. Um, and I think that's unfortunate for China. I don't think that's a way to innovate. I don't think that's a way to maintain stability, but that's what the Chinese government has chosen to do. Um, there's been a consolidation of power under Xi Jinping's rule. I, I've, I met Xi Jinping when I was in the government in a, in a, in a government meeting. I was very impressed, very intelligent. Uh, he could cover the whole world in a conversation, uh, impressed with him. But the idea that all this power is in that one person's hands doesn't seem like a very stable institution to me. That's not institutionalization. And the Chinese Communist Party for years we're saying, yes, we're not going to have multi-party democracy, but we're going to have institutionalization. And one of those great institutional uh, uh, um, objectives or one of those great institutional achievements was supposedly term limits and age restrictions on leadership. And they just re revised the Constitution, it appears, to get rid of that. Now, did they do that out of confidence or did they do that out of nervousness? They may have a reason to have done it. But it can't be a good sign for their confidence about domestic politics if they really had a reason to say, we can't afford not to give this one individual lifelong power. That must say something about their concern about the stability of the institution as a, on a broader level. And I don't, I don't take joy in that. I think it's terrible. Um, so 
That's my that's my response. Uh, and uh, you know, I, do, I I would like to see stable progress in Chinese domestic politics in a direction where this wasn't necessary, where there was you know a stronger sense of legitimacy where it wasn't necessary for the go the government, more institutionalization, and eventually more voice of Chinese people in their own political affairs. I don't say that as some kind of Trojan horse to create a revolution. I don't want to see a revolution. I just like to see change. Um, and I've, I said that when I was in the government, so the Chinese government, if it's watching me on YouTube, will not be surprised to hear it coming out of my mouth again. But it, it's part of wishing China well as a nation, is to say you want them to develop in, in a positive direction, like all the other great powers. There are no other great powers that don't have those things. And then China will be stronger. China will be more respected. And that will be good for everyone. I'm afraid that we have been defeated. I have been defeated by the clock. Um, I do apologize to those of you who have your hands up and not being able to have a chance to engage in this conversation. But um, let's now give the speaker a round of applause to show our appreciation. Thank you very much, Tom, Professor Christensen, for giving us the most fantastic second WSD Honda Distinguished Lecture. Thank you.